Hi, my name is Petko Zelazov, and this is Ratio Talks. Today, a conversation with Stephen Moisish. Stephen is a researcher in the Institute of Astronomy and Natural Sciences in Hun Ren in Budapest, Hungary. The conversation that I have with him is very multidisciplinary. We talk about evolution, about the origin of life, about the possibilities of life somewhere there in the universe, and what are the chances of actually meeting an intelligence out there. I hope you enjoy. So yeah, it is rather odd that with all the abundant evidence that we have for evolution, some people still question it. I mean, as you said, we can we can observe it life, not only through that experiment that you just described, but like observing actual large species, like different islands, like what, what Darwin essentially did. I mean, we can see it in a lifetime, can we? Depending on the species. Uh, yeah. For instance, one that has, uh, as we talked about, a very rapid reproductive cycle. There's some rodents, for instance, that can have litters two, three, four times a year. And these are the so-called R species, ones that make many, many, many offspring. Fish are a common one. Like for instance, there's some fish that, uh, female fish over the course of their lives may have 400,000 offspring. Yeah. And once, once the eggs are laid with external fertilization, then they're let go and they may even be preyed on by the parent. Yeah. But that kind of environmental selective pressure indeed can be expressed very, very rapidly in such populations. Freshwater fish, for instance, in internal or endorheic drainage systems in Africa, the so-called uh, chiclid fish, these fish from one progenitor can yield hundreds of species over a relatively short time. Not historical time, but um, many thousands of years. So then the question, and I think it's important to question things such as evolution, right? Because it deepens our understanding. But the question may arise, well, we've been domesticating dogs and cats and sheep and other animals used in animal husbandry since the last ice age, perhaps even before in the case of dogs. Have they speciated yet? No. In fact, although it's a little bit perverse to think of a chihuahua and a wolf mating, they mm -hmm. can do it and have fertile offspring. So speciation has not yet occurred, but let's take it another level. Horses and donkeys, for all intents and purposes, they resemble one another and they have offspring called mules if they're male or hinnies if they're female. These are sterile because of a disconnect between the chromosomal load of the parents. Uh, that is at the species level. Yeah. But that was a relatively recent speciation, which still yields offspring. And it also challenges us, if we think evolutionarily, about definitions of life itself. Because if you argue that life is a chemical system that is encapsulated and undergoes Darwinian evolution, meaning there's an ancestor descendant relationship, mules violate that definition, hmm. but they're clearly alive. They simply cannot reproduce. So the reason that I think it's good to question evolution is because from a Socratic point of view, it helps us deepen our understanding. Right, right. Is it fair to qualify you, Stephen, as a as a student or scholar of big history? Uh, because in like previous conversations that we had, I mean, it's it's one of the great privileges of Ratio Forum is that we get to spend some more time before the actual and after the the actual event. And uh, you strike me as a person who is interested in uh, not only in the geological and biological history of uh, of Earth and life, but uh, also in, uh, in in the history of us you know, in, in conventional history, as, as people understand it. Uh, 
do you think that uh, this is the right way to look at history, to seek this interconnectedness between uh, biology, geology, and human culture, even? Everyone has their own path to take. What is my passion is to see the connectedness of things. You mentioned uh, big picture type science or big history mm -hmm. type perspectives. I enjoy this because much like taking a uh, vacation somewhere, I like to learn the history of the place that I'm visiting. I like to have a deeper understanding of the paths that I'm walking on and who was there before. In terms of my professional life, I am interested in examining the intersection of the biosphere, which drapes our planet. Life is everywhere. It's in the driest desert. It's in the tallest mountain. It's in the, it's in the deepest ocean. It's in the coldest glacier. It soaks the surface of our planet and is affected by the evolution of our planet, the, the interior evolution of our planet. But then the challenge is what kind of effect does life have on the substrate in which it lives? How has life changed the nature of the crust, changed the way weathering occurs, sedimentation, denudation, erosion, and as such can manipulate even where mountain ranges are, where drainages of rivers can occur into the oceans, and even how plate tectonics itself can occur thanks to the stability of liquid water and life's propensity for maintaining its own habitable conditions at the planetary scale. This is amazing because, I mean, we only recently got um, got used to that line of thinking. We're thinking about the Anthropocene, yes. about how human actually affect, you know, the atmosphere and, and yes. Earth itself. Uh, but it's not very intuitive to think that, like, bacteria can actually have uh, an impact on tectonic plates, for example. But, isn't the, it amazing? Or, yeah, or how life affects uh, the, uh, the, the, the currents of the ocean. How, how does that happen it, it, it is is it about quantities you can perform the experiment yourself every minute of your life by doing this take a deep breath why do you do that because there's oxygen in the atmosphere oxygen is not the main constituent gas of our atmosphere it's another gas called yep. nitrogen Right? But oxygen is at about 21%. It's actually rising, mm -hmm. by the way. <laughs> we can get into that if you wish. We'll have more plants, I think. Yeah. Well, we have more plants, and the growing season is extending yeah. in each hemisphere. And there's more carbon dioxide in the air, which plants enjoy. Mm -hmm. Let's put it that way. But getting back to oxygen, the oxygen in our atmosphere is there thanks to the toil of bacteria. It's not rainforests or that kind of thing. While they do put oxygen in the atmosphere, the <coughs> architects of the breathable atmosphere are bacteria, cyanobacteria, pond scum, that green stuff mm. that grows on lakes and gives the, the greenish tinge to rivers and soils that are damp. It's the, it's that dark material that you see on rocks, on, on the, on the, uh, facades of city buildings after the rain, cyanobacteria, they made the atmosphere the way it is starting about two and a half billion years ago. Before that time, there was no oxygen in the atmosphere. When you start making fundamental changes like that, then you start changing everything, the nature of weathering. You have more chemical weathering, which releases more nutrients to the ocean, which causes more bacteria to bloom, which in turn feeds fish in, in the kind of trophic cycle in the oceans. But it also yields a lot of organic matter, 
all of the petroleum that we have, coal, oil, etc., natural gas is there thanks to organisms that took sunlight, captured carbon dioxide, and split water to make organic matter. And they took that carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, replaced it with oxygen, and buried that organic matter. That organic matter, as well as carbonate, like limestone from the shells of dead organisms, go into marine sediments. These two components, in turn, are recycled by the crust back into Earth's mantle. These are time scales of not years or centuries, but millions of years, tens of millions of years. But in the history of our planet, we have seen from the geologic record shifts in the way the plates function mechanically, how they're affected chemically, and as the planet has cooled, because our planet is cooling, right? The, as the planet has cooled, the nature of this recycling has likewise changed. In the absence of life on our planet, there would be no liquid water. We would have an atmosphere as dense as that of Venus. And by the way, this is our ultimate fate. Because while the planet, geologically speaking, is evolving, and biologically speaking, is evolving, the sun is also evolving. Hmm. The sun is brightening. Every time a hydrogen and a hydrogen fuse together to make helium in the fusion reaction of the sun, energy is released. But in doing so, you take two hydrogens and make one helium, which is twice the mass. Mm -hmm. When you do that, you increase the density of the interior of the sun, which increases the rate of this reaction of fusion of hydrogen to helium. So over time, the sun gets brighter and brighter. And over time, the amount of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases has decreased thanks to the activity of life. But there's an end of the world as we know it. Something like 900 million years from now, perhaps less, we have to have no greenhouse gases in our atmosphere if we want to maintain a stable climate in the face of uh, the growing luminosity of the sun. And this is uh, sobering to think about because you may say, ah, 900 million years, nope, who cares? Well, that means that we're already in very late middle age of our biosphere. Mm. And that is interesting to contemplate in the search for life elsewhere in our galaxy. Yeah, it might, I mean, when you say that our faith is sealed, it, it might mean that it is fundamentally the end of life itself. I mean, if we, if we accept that Earth is the only place that, that sustains life right now. But that's not what you believe in, right? Well, what I understand is based on observations over the last 25 years or so that now every star that you see in the sky has planets around it. There are 200 billion stars in our galaxy alone. If I was to fill up this, uh, this glass here with sand, there would be about 15 million sand grains. What if I was to tell you that there are a thousand times more planets like Earth just in our galaxy, hmm. that the grains of sand would fill a wine barrel? It seems evident that there's life elsewhere, even in our galaxy. Where is it? We do not know. We cannot detect it yet. We do not have the technology to see Earth, even if it was around our closest star. We're working on it. Once we have the eyes to do that, then we can see really, literally speaking, we can see our context 
in the universe. And to me, that is going to open a golden age of exploration. We've, we're only up to now, it's, it's just practice hmm. for what's to come. It's funny how you say something that is a statistical certainty, you know, that there is plenty of life out there, uh, but it's still not scientific orthodoxy. You know, it's still uh, it's still considered as something controversial to say. Is that because science is way too rigorous to allow us to uh, to think of ideas like that as uh, very plausible, at least? Well, the business of science is to formulate good theories that make predictions. If you understand how a system works by creating a model of that system, whether mechanical or numerical or, or just by argument, if you truly understand it, you can ask good questions like, well, if what I say is correct, statistically that there are 17 billion earths out there, then we can go out and try to test that by observation. We would look at stars that are similar to our star. Stars that have relatively long lifetimes, that are relatively stable, that in other words, aren't too bright, aren't too dim, and that there are enough of them. We have all of those in our catalog of observations. The challenge now is to design the tools in order to mm. look for these. And uh, this is an area of vigorous work right now, building more and more complex, capable space and ground-based telescopes. So what is it that we are actually looking for? Is it science of uh, organic matter? Uh, is it um, intelligence? Is it, uh, is, it, is it all of these? Because I mean, evolution, although it has like very basic uh, principle, in the way that it unfolds. And we assume that evolution works uh, the same in its principles everywhere. That if there is life out there in the universe, it will almost certainly be a product of evolution as, as, as we know it. Uh, but evolution doesn't define the end result. I mean, can we, can we imagine a life that doesn't produce any, any signature? Certainly. For most of the history of life on our planet, you would, uh, you would look at the earth and be uncertain whether there was any life there from a distance. Mm -hmm. So absent radio signals and so forth, the only recourse we have is analysis of the atmosphere remotely. Let me put it this way. Imagine that you are standing on the shores of a beach in Portugal around the year 1400 and you're staring west and you think that there might be land out there, but all the legends have told you, don't go there. You will reach doom because of monsters or whatever mythological <coughs> worldview has told you. Then you ask yourself, well, what are some ways that I could know whether or not there's some place to land my ship out there. Well, I could be brave, but then try to find sailors that will <laughs> sail with you into the unknown. Or you can try to be clever about it and see if there is some evidence of land out there. You just, you, you immediately notice how difficult that is. You, you can't see reflections in the sky. You, there, there is no drift of debris that's going to cross the Atlantic. And this is the kind of conundrum that we're in now. H how do we acquire the tools in order to answer the question whether or not life is on a planet elsewhere? Then I'll get to the one about whether there's an evolutionary track towards communicable intelligences. Mm -hmm. The only way we're going to get information about a planet 
and its interior and its proclivity to host a biosphere is by retrieval analysis of data of its atmosphere. When a planet orbits its star, right, there are times where the sunlight of the star passes through the atmosphere of that planet. We have techniques now to analyze that light, to separate it away from the starlight. In other words, to get the planetary atmosphere signal. The trick is to interpret that. So we're, we're speaking about spe spectrometry? Is we're that speaking about spectroscopy. Spectroscopy, yeah. Where you have the absorption of certain wavelengths of light by molecules in a gas, mm -hmm. which then gives you information about what molecules are in that gas, in this case, the atmosphere. But imagine we, we find such an atmosphere that is water rich and even has oxygen and nitrogen in it, but there's no signal there. And then we have something about its albedo, so how dark it is or how light it is. And we find that um, this world seems to be an ocean world. Can you imagine an intelligence existing in an ocean world? Certainly. Yes. Think about uh, how clever whales are. Beautiful songs that maybe they have histories that they share, culture, etc., but they can never have technology mm. because how do you build a fire to extract metals, to create semiconductors. Mm. And there may be these, from the point of view of a technological civilization as ours, these kind of, for lack of a better term, dead ends where your evolutionary path has precluded your ability to build a radio. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> How lucky we are. Yeah, yeah. But still, considering the huge numbers that we're talking about, I mean, what are the statistical odds that we get an intelligent life? Uh, we used to have a, a, a guest uh, here, Stephen Lacomba, who uh, was uh, like, he gave us a statistical analysis and he um, actually showed the opposite that the possibility of uh, intelligent of, of of intelligence as we understand it you know like uh, intelligence that can produce technology is extremely low do you agree with that assessment statistics statistics and damn statistics we have a sample of one right so the answer to any statistical analysis of the likelihood of civilizations has to yield at least one. Yeah. So I have seen such works where the analysis gets something like 10 to the minus seven. And that cannot be right mm. because we are here. So this is a, an exercise that is amusing, but I think not necessarily informative. I just want to point out a fundamental barrier to our progress in all of this. We do not know how life began on earth. We have a, a pretty good idea of when. We may even have a better idea of where. Hmm. But we do not know how exactly, and we certainly don't know why. Why is one of those difficult questions. Why does earth have life and Venus and Mars apparently do not, even if the three planets were relatively similar to one another in their earliest days. So without such progress, we may be much like the ancient natural philosophers of Greece who looked at a glass of water and said, well, water is one of the four essential elements, isn't it mm. not? Is it not? Mm. Earth, air, fire, and water. But you ask any person uh, around you on the street somewhere, what is water? They will quickly respond, why? It's H2O. Yeah. Think about the enormous 
amount of work that goes behind that answer. A simple answer of two hydrogens and an oxygen, you have to understand there are things like elements, there's, there's bonding, bond angle, all of that goes into the answer. And I think we are as far away from understanding the origin of life and the definition of life as these natural philosophers were to understanding the nature of water. But why is that? I mean, opening a biology textbook, uh, there was a <laughs> there was some certainty in the statements that are being made there, right? I mean, so we have the oh, what do we have? We, we have the RNA hypothesis. Yes, we have yes. uh, uh, the primordial soup uh, experiments. Mm -hmm. We have uh, we have all of these, um, you know, experiments or or, or um, you know knowledge that we and 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 at the end you still say that we have no idea how life originated. Life is fabulously complex. Even the most primitive organism that one finds deep in crustal rocks and sediments at the bottom of the seafloor somewhere already has 4 billion years of evolution under its belt. Mm. So we are uh, then obliged to try to do forward modeling, start with simple organic molecules and try to assemble them together in these prebiotic experiments, some of which you mentioned, to more and more complex stuff. We find that there are pathways that look natural to something like RNA, ribonucleic acid, <clears throat> which is a remarkable molecule. It has, uh, it's relatively simple. It's simpler than DNA. It can be made in the laboratory and it can even be polymerized. So the building blocks of it can be, can be linked together using natural substances like volcanic glass. Remarkable work. But there's no information there. Hmm. Where, where did information for life come from? If the origin of life is the origin <coughs> of evolution, the origin of evolution is the origin of information. Whence came information in nature? This we are very, very, very far from. It doesn't mean that is that it is an insurmountable problem, right? Because actually that would be unscientific hmm. <laughs> to say that. But we have to impart information and then allow the system to increase in complexity, but still be managed because unmanaged complexity leads to gibberish, leads to asphalt, hmm. essentially, leads to uh, tar, something that's useless, right? Leads to, leads to, I, I'll tell you what, it leads to caramel. Hmm. <laughs> what are you, what are you, what are you saying here? I'm that, yeah. that, that, mm -hmm. uh, that evolution is guided? No, that it has, Evolution early on, chemical evolution early on, had to manage itself by confinement. There are two ways to manage complexity. Okay. One is that you take something that becomes more and more complex and you break it apart. Life does this. We do it in our metabolism. When you eat, uh, when you eat a cookie, you're eating complex organic molecules and enzymes in your body are cutting these complex molecules apart to use as building blocks for your cells. But there weren't such enzymes around. Enzymes are, are coded and programmed by, by DNA in your cells. So where did enzymes come from? Well, the other way of dealing with complexity is to compartmentalize it, to manage it by in, enclosing it and isolating hmm. molecules that reach a certain level of complexity, and then you stop them from going any further. And that must be the origin of the cell. All living things are cellular. This is the cellular theory of life.
They're encapsulated. You can make such cellular structures by just taking a meteorite and powdering it and adding it to water. Fatty acids contained in the meteorite are go into water and there's a hydrophobic, water loving and a hydro a hydro water hating, hydrophobic and a hydrophilic side and it makes these spheres, these bubbles. These uh, can capture some of these primitive RNAs and with primitive metabolisms, energy that is uh, yielded from chemical reactions on mineral surfaces, then you have a prebiotic organism. You have something that's the first step towards biology. Each of these has been done independently by different laboratories. Some of the best chemists in the world are working on the problem. But what has escaped us is putting these all together. The three components of a cell, the information in the RNA molecule, and the metabolism to power it. Somewhere on the early earth, naturally, these three components came together and then led to the first organisms, the first biological entities. The best scenario, naturally speaking, to explain where something like that could occur would be on dry land, not in the open ocean, not at the bottom of the ocean, where if you make something chemically, it goes into the ocean and it's lost to dilution. You need to concentrate components. As long as you have dry land present, and you can imagine an ice land or someplace where you have different pools of different chemistry with little streams running out of them and mixing at different temperatures and different chemistries. Because what do you need to get life started? Ultimately, you need liquid water, of which we are in abundance, energy resources from chemical disequilibria, like from Re mineral reactions in water, organic raw materials, which are made naturally in gas phase reactions in the atmosphere. But the fourth thing that people forget about is that you need time. It's not going to happen overnight. So from the point of view of a geologist like me, a scenario emerges out of this train of thought of something along the lines of an Iceland, uh, a volcanic island that uh, has lakes and hydrothermal systems, anywhere where water interacts with hot rock. And you do this bathed in a fluid envelope of an atmosphere that is very, very different from what we have today. That is what I call Hadean biogeodynamics. It's the, it's the beginning of the biosphere that is in the context of the emergent geosphere. You did say that, you know, the, 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 the three questions, when, where, and how. Mm -hmm. So we're just struggling on the how you just yes. explain, uh, you basically, you essentially explain the location, you know, it's like how it might have looked like we do, do we have an idea where it might originate? You mentioned Greenland, for instance, or something similar. Or well, um, where the world is a big place. Mm. If you right now, uh, let me, let me just r put us in context for a moment. Let's talk about the parameters. The oceans are four kilometers deep approximately on average, mm. right? It's pretty deep. And that's because the continents are there and they're displacing water. If you took the continents away, right, which may be something that broadly resembles the early earth, then you're displacing less water. So the oceans, instead of being four <coughs> kilometers deep, 
become two kilometers deep. Two kilometers deep is, it sounds deep, but it isn't. Mm. If the oceans now were only two kilometers deep, we would have enormous amount of land mass. All of the volcanoes that you see at the bottom of the ocean along mid-ocean ridges and so on would be dry. So the kind of uh, environment can't be pointed to specifically at any geographical spot because what I'm talking about is a global chemical reactor, which going back to the early part of our conversation helps us in our search for life elsewhere, because what kind of planet and what kind of ingredients do you need for life? Life is carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus, and a few other things, right? Those are the, amongst the most common elements in the universe. So the chemistry of life might be common, hmm. which is good because it, it means that it is understandable. <laughs> That's useful. Hmm. However, you also need a planet. You can't assemble these molecules even in an asteroid or in an icy moon around a gas giant at the edge of the solar system. It helps to have a planet where you have a dynamic crust with a, a hot interior mantle. You melt that crust to make new crust and it's in contact with liquid water and an atmosphere. So the planet, this is key. This is a key point. The planet is like a giant battery. Electrons are flowing from the interior of the planet to the exterior. This is called a redox gradient, relatively reduced electron rich source, rocks and mantle to a relatively oxidized electron poor exterior. So you're flowing electrons there. As long as you can maintain that planetary system that I just described, that flow of electrons can power the chemistry towards the first life. This mm -hmm. is called chemosynthesis. If on the other hand, the planet is too small, it cools quickly, loses its atmosphere, no ocean, it, it, it stops before anything biological could even get started. But what about if you imagine an earth that's twice the mass, three times the mass, it means a lot of geological activity. And there doesn't seem to be any barrier to such planets, which are called super earths, something that we're already beginning to see exist around other stars, to having biological type chemistry there too. But it's a matter of time before we find evidence of that. So we're speaking about similar planets as well, and obviously size does matter of the planet. Do super Earths, uh, are, are, they, are there places where life can evolve? I mean, that's what you essentially said? Yeah, I don't see any physical, chemical, or mechanical barrier. It's just to... that there is much more gravity, much more energy, much more... Yes. Hmm. It would, what, what would be the nature of such a planet? Well, uh, like I said, uh, we're beginning to see these in our observations by, for instance, the James Webb Space Telescope and by other uh, telescopic methods, that um, our solar system is, uh, is not representative of solar systems in general. Hmm. We have these inner rocky planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, then the, this gap occupied by small amount of mass in the asteroid belt. Then we have these giant planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. That is this dichotomy of the solar system, inner rocky, outer gaseous. Other solar systems are different. There are planets there that are not represented in our solar system, super Earths, things that are three, four, six times Earth's mass, 
or sub-Neptunes, something that is maybe 10 times Earth's mass, but smaller than Neptune. So these in-between planets that may have hybrid atmosphere, something that's outgassed from the interior, mixed with what was captured from the original gas around the star from which the planets formed. So this is where we have to teach ourselves. We have to relearn what it means to be a solar system. And we can start performing experiments, even in the laboratory, to simulate the kind of conditions in these exotic worlds to see just how differently they behave compared to our own life-giving world. Time is a key question here. I mean, you did say it's one of the components that we usually don't think about. Yes. Um, and as far as I remember, I'm not an expert in biology, but there are like two main uh, theories in terms of how life evolves uh, to the complexity that we see today. There is, uh, you know, the, the, the standard that there it takes, that, that evolution is extremely slow. It's taking its pace. It's like little by little, you know, things yes. get more interesting and more interesting. And then you have, uh, was it Stephen Jay Gould, I think, that with the point at equilibrium, it's like with these moments in evolution where you have like a rapid jump and complexity. Yes. Uh, if we think about uh, other planets, uh, younger systems, uh, and then we extrapolate what we know of how long it took for life on Earth to uh, evolve, and then we see a system which is like one billion years old, yes. uh, do we automatically exclude that? Or based on the theory that evolution can jump like much more quicker, life can still be observed in, in, in younger places? All right, so the, mm. the, the two ideas that you mentioned, one is called uh, gradualism. Yes. And uh, that is something that can be tested by looking at the fossil record. Mm -hmm. the fossil record, for instance, of the last half billion years is pretty good. So one can see if, uh, you know, there's a conservation of form and people like to say, oh, look at the cockroach hasn't changed in 300 million years mm. and so on. That's a great example of conservation of, of form. And Sharks, another one. Sharks, evolutionary spe evolutionarily speaking, <coughs> predate just about every tree you'll ever see. Hmm. They were around before trees. Trees. That's mind blowing. <laughs> it's mind blowing. <laughs> yeah. Now, what about the other idea? So this is called punctuated equilibrium. Punctuated. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So you have these uh, rapid speciation events. Much of that seems to be due in complex organisms to developmental timing genes. Genes that are in the genome that instruct the body to, to have new functions, right? For instance, grow at this particular stage, uh, reach puberty at this particular stage, uh, uh, lose fertility at this particular stage, die at that particular stage. So these developmental timing genes also govern form, mm -hmm. phenotype. So for instance, a classic example would be uh, organisms like, um, like trilobites, uh, cra these crab-like things that went extinct uh, quite some time ago. But you can see that just uh, some change in developmental ch timing gene could make, you know, longer bodies, shorter bodies, different, different shapes of what's known as the cephalon mm -hmm. part of the trilobite where the big eyes are and spines and all kinds of things that, that could happen quite rapidly. We see this in the geologic record. We even see it now. We see it in insects. Uh, we see it especially because they've got very short life cycles. We see it in rodents, for instance, um, which can have two, three, four litters per year that they acquire resistance to some poisonous plants in, in island habitats and then quickly uh, acquire the ability to use these plants as food. So there, there are many examples of that, but how does that translate temporally into making a world more obviously life-bearing that we could observe. 
We don't know. Mm. Uh, for our planet, it took two billion years from the origin of life before oxygen began to rise a little bit in the atmosphere with the advent of the invention of oxygenic photosynthesis. Oxygenic photosynthesis is one of those things that in hindsight seems very obvious. I mean, after all, light energy is free. Water is everywhere. Carbon dioxide is abundant. If, if you could manage to use light energy to split a water molecule and use that to make organic matter from carbon dioxide, then you're golden, right? How difficult that is, is a, is a, is a question that is hard to answer. We know that before cyanobacteria invented what I just told you, two and a half billion years ago, that there were precursors. There were proto-cyanobacteria. We don't know much about them. But for every appearance of anything in the fossil record, there's a progenitor, and it doesn't mean the first appearance of it is mm. exactly when it appeared, mm. right? It's just the, the earliest that it was preserved. So I don't know until we find something if a one billion year old planet could have an oxygen rich atmosphere mm. from cyanobacteria or not. Do you, I wonder, I mean, you, you work in a field in which uh, you've reached a point in your field in which you, you just say, we have no idea, right? Like how these four components were the most difficult one, information, like how they got together and produced life, life on Earth. Uh, do you get tempted to uh, to think of um, other ways this might have happened, like like some controversial these, like 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 the panspermia uh, theory, uh, like uh, that it was planted here, life was planted here and created somewhere else. Um, God, for Christ's sake, I don't know. I mean, do you do you get tempted? Well, uh, let's. I like the scientific worldview because it's the one that is uh, most successful at making predictions. Mm -hmm. uh, mythological worldview, like the one that you mentioned, uh, the last possibility mm. there, is untestable. Yeah. And so if, if we just put that aside for now, and then we look at something that is, it, it's interesting, it's a, it's a, it's something that is amusing to talk about uh, in dinner conversation, mm. for example, or in a podcast <laughs> called directed panspermia. Right. The idea that uh, the, all of the chemical conditions that uh, I talked to you about and then putting all of that together somehow seems like a nightmare, right? Yeah. How do you do it? But... Uh, Ignorance of a mechanism does not equal impossibility of that mechanism. Mm -hmm. People claimed that the whole idea of, uh, of flight, of powered flight, was preposterous mm -hmm. up until the time that it was demonstrated, which quickly led, in a matter of years, to the evolution of planes and um, and ultimately of spacecraft. So what about panspermia? What about the idea that life emerged somewhere and is distributed either naturally or unnaturally across the universe? Well, the first reaction that you often hear is, well, that's not useful because it just moves the problem someplace else. Yes. You have to answer the same question, but yeah. Yeah, you have to answer the same question. But, um, you know, I'm bored of hearing the same answer mm. all the time. I like to I like to really push the boundaries, you know, do stress tests on the system. And I would say, well, if that is true, then how come we don't see it happening now? What is preventing material from space coming to earth and seeding the earth now with foreign life. 
We see no such thing. Uh, we have samples of the surfaces of asteroids now. Bennu and Ryugu and Itakawa, thanks to the uh, Japanese and American space agencies. We have um, samples from the surface of the moon, thanks most recently to the successful Chang'e 6 mission of, the, of China, but of course the Apollo program and other, and other programs to the moon, uh, including the Soviet space program. And the moon and asteroids have been accumulating debris on their surfaces, sort of like flypaper mm. for billions of years. And there's nothing, nothing living. But let's say something did come to the earth now. Where is it? We've, we've sampled the biosphere and there's nothing living now that doesn't fit into the tree of life somewhere. Let's say life still exists on Mars and occasionally contaminates the earth. Like these meteorites that mm. we're going to see at the forum tomorrow. Well, that would mean foreign life coming to the earth. It would have to survive somehow in our environment, but there's nothing living that we have found that doesn't fit with all other living things. Everything alive now is related to everything alive now. Hmm. Except, except Dr. Pai, some people say that. <laughs> That's <laughs> preposterous. <laughs> of course it is. <laughs> but they're very alien-like, you have to agree. Oh, they're lovely creatures. Oh yeah, they are. Terrifying. Like three brains, you know, what, what, what's with that? It's Weird. And and binocular color vision and yeah. uh, just lovely creatures. Yeah, but um, they're they're in the branch Animalia, just mm -hmm. like us, mm -hmm. and we are we are closer to them evolutionarily uh, speaking than um, than we are to sequoia trees or or toadstool fungi or slime molds or and then those organisms that I just mentioned, we're all more closely, closely related to one another than the, the red algae that you see in salty ponds, mm. or for that matter, in your Himalayan sea salt. <laughs> Himalayan sea salt is red because it's filled with the corpses of halobacteria that formed in the drying salt pans as India was smashing into South Asia, beginning about, started 40 million years ago, but really beginning in earnest about 8 million years ago, where the, the drying remnants of the, of the Tethys Sea were evaporating and leaving behind salt flats that were populated by these strange, non or anoxygenic photosynthesizing red bacteria that uh, lend their red pigment called rhodopsin to the Himalayan sea salt. Rhodopsin is a pigment, the red pigment that these organisms use to capture sunlight for energy and photosynthesis. It's the same pigment that we have in our eyes for night vision. We have so many evolutionary echoes of our microbial ancestral past in our own organism today. So the next time you think about night vision and why you only see shades of gray when it is dark, it's because of the uh, rhodopsin receptors that are in your eye that are chemically akin to the anoxygenic photosynthesizers. <sighs> Yeah, science is the greatest story ever told, right? I mean, this is the perspective that we want to give people uh, when we speak to, to, to scientists. I mean, it's, uh, that was amazing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Steve. My sincere pleasure. <laughs>